And do you see that? Do you see that full screen? Yes, awesome. Well, welcome everybody. Thanks for tuning in tonight. Again, my name is Tom Griffin and I'm a, a wildlife technician with Fishing Game. And we're gonna talk about ways to be safe around moose and bears um, here in, in Alaska and in our community in Anchorage. And for starters, our goal is to increase our overall knowledge about being safe outside when we encounter moose and bears. Um, especially right here in our community, we, we often see moose and occasionally see bears. Uh, we wanna reduce our risk in bear and moose country. And we wanna put emphasis on critical thinking and personal responsibility. It's really good to know the basics when we get out there because we want to be outside recreating, hiking, biking, fishing, hunting as Alaskans, and we want to know the do's and don'ts. It's really important. Now, we live here uh, in Anchorage where our backyard is, is full with these green spaces, like in this, this shot right here. Um, you can kind of see behind these backyards, we see a green space, which is common in here in, in town. And right along that green space is an anadromous fish stream where in summer months when the fish come back, that's where the fish are and therefore that's where we often encounter bears. We also encounter moose in, these, in this habitat because we have a lot of willow and really high quality habitat. We also notice that we're, we also put out trash and other things right in our backyards that sometimes can attract these animals into our yards and we have to be really careful with those attractants. So we're gonna go over all those things tonight. Now we live here in Alaska, in Southern Alaska with two types of bears, the black bear on the left and the brown bear on the right. And how do you differentiate between the two? Because they both can be very, very dark brown. Uh, they can be similar in color. Uh, some brown grizzly bears are almost black and some, uh, uh, Black bears are cinnamon brown. So we wanna look at some distinguishing characteristics. Like the brown grizzly bear has that great big hump on his back, that great scapula. In the black bear, not so much. Uh, the brown grizz has the elongated claws, uh, very long. And the black bear has that short C-shaped claw, very good climbers. They're often found in trees, especially if they're trying to uh, move away from, from us sometimes. they'll climb up a tree. Uh, so it's possible to see a brown grizzly bear in a tree, but not near as likely um, as seeing a black bear up in a tree. So sometimes folks will see that cinnamon brown colored bear and assume it's a brown grizzly bear, but in fact, it could be a cinnamon black bear. So it's good to pay attention to these characteristics. Another characteristic is the skull. The skull has a slightly different shape. The brown grizz has a little dish shape between the eyes. Let me pull out a skull here. I have a different here. Um, the brown grizz has a, a little dish shape right here between the forehead and the tip of the nose. And that black bear has that really straight Roman nose. Uh, so they have a slightly uh, different skull shape, but that's very subtle. Uh, whereas that hump is an easier thing to see or not see if it's not present if you're trying to identify those two species, if you encounter a bear. Why are they here with us in our community? We have amazing habitat. We have uh, salmon right here in town, in Fish Creek, uh, Chester Creek, Campbell Creek. We have blueberries up here in, on the mountains, just right here in the Chugach State Park in our backyard and through many of the municipal parks too. Uh, of course, Devil's Club, bears will eat the devil's club berries. We have uh, sedge grasses here along the coastal refuge. And then of course the moose love to scrape the willow. They love to hoof through the low bush, through the snow to get to the low bush cranberry or the dwarf dogwood. We have, uh, we have all these great foods, wild foods for bears and moose. And that's uh, the primary reason why we have so many of them. Now bears in Alaska, a lot of people think of bears being in uh, wild places far from a city or uh, 
human dwellings. But as we know, we live with brown grizzly bears and black bears right here in the city of Anchorage in our backyard. We live kind of the urban wilderness, have you? Uh, they're right here, right not, not far from downtown by Ship Creek and places like that in the summertime. So we live with these animals and we need to know what to do when we encounter them. Here's a, an image uh, from a national park here where um, a group of hikers uh, was moved, they were moving, they had been moving prior to this photo away from this bear quickly. And the bear uh, was following. And evidently a ranger from across the, the creek had uh, shouted out to stop and stand your ground. And then the bear stopped and eventually the bear moved off. Uh, so we're gonna reinforce some of those concepts tonight about traveling in a group and standing your ground when you encounter a bear. So be prepared and be aware when you're out there. For one, when you head out on the trails, go in a group. It's always better to go in a group, make noise. We're talking about clapping, a little bit of hay bear, whole bear, um, make noise out there, human conversation is good. If you start to get dispersed, kind of spread out, you know how we are. Um, it's good as we get into the thick brush to hold up and allow that group to come together, okay, in a human group. Now, it's good to have a deterrent. Um, one deterrent that people can choose is bear spray um, and know how to use it. Um, be sure you know how to take the clip off and use the, the deterrent if need be. Okay, move cautiously, especially along creeks and streams and blind corners. Just slow down a bit and give a clap out, a little hay bear, whole bear, before you go around those blind spots. It's really important not to uh, kind of go around there quickly and quietly. Don't spread out again. If you get a little spread out, group back up. Keep the dog on a leash. If your dog's like my dog, they like to run up ahead and bark and agitate moose or bears. And therefore that animal could get very stressed. And sometimes the, the, your dog may come back to you with a moose behind it. So it's good to keep those animals on a leash, those pets on a leash out there. If you're on the trail, use your senses, um, use your eyes and your ears out there. It's a good time to take the earbuds out of the ears. A lot of us like to listen to music out there and um, it's not a good idea it's a, uh, to be hiking with the earbuds in. It's better to use the ears in case you do hear some huffing or popping in, in the brush or even a moose um, nearby starting to make some movements out there. So take the earbuds out when you're on the trail, use the ears and the eyes and pay attention. Be aware, look for the tracks, uh, five toes and five claws in the mud. If you see those, those tracks with the big uh, claw tips way out in front of the toe, it may be a brown grizzly bear. Um, of course, if those claw tips are right in front of the toe, then it's a little bit more of a, oh, a, curved, a curved track, something like this track right here, it might be a black bear, right? With it, those claws are right out in front of the toes. The brown grizz, of course, is typically um, a larger track with claw tips way out in front of the toes. Uh, so there are some subtle differences if you see some tracks and you like to pay attention to what you see out there. Um, also pay attention for scat, um, scratch marks on trees, areas that have been grazed on or willow that have been scraped by, by a moose. So just pay attention to your surroundings and look for sign. Your behavior may influence the outcome of the bear encounter or moose encounter. So it's really important. We're gonna talk about bears first, uh, and then we'll talk about moose. It's really important to know what to do. First of all, when you encounter a bear, we often um, get hit with a wave of, of adrenaline, and, and that can make us a little nervous. And sometimes we uh, respond to that adrenaline by doing the wrong thing. We move away too quickly or run away or panic. And that's what we don't wanna do. It says, stay calm. Now I know that you might not feel calm, but you need to act calm, okay? Even if you're feeling kind of nervous, which is understandable, don't panic. Um, never run from a bear. It's really important. These animals have eyes in the front. They like to hunt. 
they pursue things that run away. And so that's what they do instinctually. So it's really important not to run. So if you encounter that bear, you start to take a step back, stop, group up, hold the ground. Now, if the bear does not notice you, move away quietly. So if I see a bear up in the distance grazing on berries, I'm fairly certain the bear does not notice me. I can move away quietly, keeping my eyes on the bear, just in case the bear did see me and does start to follow. Um, if the bear does notice me, stop, ready the deterrent. So it's good to have that deterrent accessible um, on a belt or not in the back of the pack. So ready the deterrent and uh, face the bear, group together with your group and talk to the bear calmly, okay? Uh, calm tone of voice, human voice is good. Very important to act calm and hold the ground. Okay, behavior of a defensive bear. A defensive bear is a bear that you surprise or you crowd, uh, especially one like a maternal female with cubs that you accidentally um, get into that animal's space or that animal's bubble. And if you accidentally cross that line, um, it's really important to know that this animal is going to become typically very stressed and may act defensively. And that's where they might start huffing, that, that huffing and that popping sound that they make in the throat. Um, and so that's pretty typical of a defensive bear. They might salivate. The ears go back when the animal's stressed. Um, you know, the bear may put a rush on you. It may put a charge on you. Um, so it's really important to know this is a defensive animal, especially if I have walked within the bear's space accidentally. The behavior of a non-defensive bear is a bear that usually approaches silently. The ears are up. It may be focused on you and may be approaching deliberately. It may not appear to be stressed. Um, you may be in its travel route or it might just be curious. It might be testing dominance. Um, the animal might be food conditioned uh, near a location where this bear has gotten food rewards uh, near a campsite, uh, things of this nature. Um, it may be potentially predatory. So it's good to pay attention to this situation. How to respond in these encounters, very important. A defensive bear. This is the bear where like the maternal female where I, I accidentally walk into the bear's space. It's really important to stop, ready the deterrent, okay? Um, use a calm tone of voice, hey bear, whole bear. Group up, watch the bear and do not run. Um, deploy the, the deterrent if the bear comes within range. Uh, very important. Now, when I say watch the bear, um, I'm not staring the bear down in the eyes. I'm watching the bear's body very closely, but I'm not trying to lock eyes with the bear or give the bear an intense stare. But I am watching the animal by watching the, the bear's body. The non-defensive bear is very similar, but there, there is a difference. Okay, so stop. Again, ready the deterrent. And in a calm tone of voice, talk to the bear, group up, watch the bear, do not run. We can't put enough emphasis on do not run and do not move away quickly. If the bear continues to approach, up your game to drive the bear off. That means make more noise. This is not a bear that I startled. Or I didn't just walk into its space. This bear may be coming into my space and I might start upping my game if it starts to come into that, that personal boundary or approaching. Deploy the deterrent if the bear becomes within range. If a bear makes contact with you, if it was a defensive bear attack, if I stepped into the bubble of this bear, it's really important to be able to have that wherewithal to think that this is a defensive situation. Lie face down, hands clasped behind the neck, spread your legs and elbow. Do not struggle or cry out. If the bear sees you as a threat, it will like, if the bear sees, no longer sees you as a, a threat, the bear will likely leave the area. Okay, so that's where we play dead in that given situation. Um, 
Here's a picture of a coworker up in Fairbanks talking to a school group. And you can see this young person splayed out, I, the, the hands clasped behind the head, the feet wide. And that's if, the, if that person did get flipped over, um, they wanna get back on their belly. Okay, you, don't, you wanna keep the backpack on if you have a backpack to help protect your spine. Um, so this is a defensive bear attack. Now, in a predatory bear attack that is non-defensive, if the bear makes contact with you, now let me back up, if it's predatory, non-defensive, this is a bear that I didn't startle, I didn't walk into its space. It's approaching me calmly, ears forward, and it will not go away. And it seems like it's focused on me. If this bear uh, does make contact with me, aggressively fight the bear with any means available. Um, concentrate on the bear's face, eyes, and nose. Okay, this is if it's what we call a predatory or non-defensive attack. Uh, so this is very important if, if this were to ever happen to you. Let's review what to do when encountering the, the defensive bear. And remember the defensive bear is, for instance, that maternal female with cubs where we, we walk into the space of the bear. We startled the bear accidentally, okay? Stop, assess, use those critical thinking skills, even though you have adrenaline on board, ready the deterrent, make ready, take the clip off, use a calm voice, group up, talk to the bear, do not run, okay? Deploy the deterrent if the bear comes in within range, very important. What to do when encountering a non-defensive bear? Now let's review a non-defensive bear is a bear that we didn't startle. This bear may be coming into our space and this bear is not being easily deterred. It may not appear very stressed uh, like a defensive bear. Uh, stop. It's very similar to um, what we just talked about with some exceptions. Now stop and assess. Ready the deterrent. Talk to the bear in a calm tone of voice. Watch the bear and do not run. If the bear is persistent and does not go away, up your game. Make more noise. Clap. Shout at that bear in a firm tone of voice. Deploy the deterrent if the bear comes within range. Um, so our behavior is different if we encounter a non-defensive and or possibly a predatory bear. Very important to know the difference. Be aware and be prepared when you're out there. And when we're going for that hike out there, right up the backside of Flat Top or one of our many, many trails in the municipality or in the state park or anywhere in Alaska, have that deterrent handy. Okay, don't put it in the back of the pack. Keep it somewhere accessible. Um, when you go hiking, make a plan. Make sure someone knows what trail you're on and where you're going and what time you plan on being back. Just so that in case you had an injury or um, you were missing, people know where to look for you. Because we live in a large community with a lot of different trailheads. Uh, so it's, it's really important that you have a plan uh, be aware out there, look for the tracks, look for the scat, look for the sign, use your eyes and your ears, take the ear, the earbuds out when you're on the trail. Carry the bear spray and keep it accessible. Travel in a group, okay? It's always safer to be in a group and not be by yourself. Really important, if you can, can be with a group, go with a group, buddy up. Keep the dogs on a leash. Okay, because sometimes, like I said, those dogs will um, run ahead of us and, and start barking at a bear or a moose. And if that's a maternal female bear with cubs, she may chase your dog. Your dog may run back to you with a bear and behind it. And that is not very safe. Let, let the neighbors know if you're seeing moose and bears in a given area. A lot of our neighborhoods were on a listserv and we uh, share information. And so it's really good to share information with your, with your neighbors in those different formats, just so they know uh, what's going on out there. Uh, very important for safety, especially with kids in our neighborhoods. It's just really good to communicate, communicate, and communicate. So keep that in mind. When you go camping, 
pick a safe campsite. And what we're talking about is avoiding camping on a bear trail, okay, in the thick alders. Try to pick a, a safer place where you have good line of sight if possible. Um, practice leave no trace, don't leave uh, attractants out there, any trash out there. Bears have an amazing olfactory sense of smell. And if we're leaving any, any interesting smells out there that can attract a bear into um, our camping area. We recommend using the triangle method. And what we're talking about is if we pick a location to set up our tent, we never wanna store the food in the tent. And it's not really a good idea to cook right outside of your tent. It's better to cook a ways away from the tent and store food away from the tent. And if, it, if there is a breeze, it's ideal to have your tent uh, set up so that um, it is not downwind of scented food items or uh, where you cook. So you can see here where the wind is blowing, the, the stove smells and the food storage smells away from the tent. So this is important when you're picking a spot to camp. A lot of people store the food in a bear barrel. Highly recommendable. Uh, put that food in a bear barrel. If you do have trees, you can put the bear barrel in, I'm sorry, um, the, the, the food barrel where you put the, the, the bear, the, your, your cooking food into this um, bear resistant food canister. And you wanna put that maybe up in a tree in, in a satchel if possible. In Alaska, we don't have too many of these poles like in this picture, this developed campground. Um, if you can put it up in a tree, that's great. As long as it's in the bear resistant canister, that's really important out there. Uh, that way if a black bear easily uh, can shimmy up a tree, um, they might swat at that, uh, that food. But if it's in a bear resistant canister, um, they can't easily get it. Do not for store the food in tents, very important. Um, fishing. Um, we all get fish fever. I know I do. We love to fish, fish, fish. And it's just good to know the basics when we're out there. Um, go fishing with others if you can. Okay. Carry the bear. I'm sorry, the bear spray or the deterrent uh, when you go out fishing like along the Russian River or various rivers and streams in Alaska. Very important. If we do catch a fish, it's really important to take those parts that we're not going to eat um, you know, and dispose of those guts and parts that we're not going to eat in the fast moving water. So we don't leave those um, extra parts right alongside the river where we fish because they become an attractant for bears nearby. So it's important to take that stuff and chop it up and throw it out in the fast moving water. Um, keep the fish uh, in the coolers nearby. So I keep that, if I have my stuff in a small cooler, I keep it quite accessible so that if I have to pick up that cooler and move off the stream, um, I can do, do so quite easily. So my gear is not sort of spread out. Um, I often have my tackle and my gear in my backpack and um, I can easily pick up my gear and move, move away slowly if I need to. If a bear approaches when you have a fish on, cut the line. Just let it go. We don't want to get into a tug of war with uh, a bear over a fish. Now, a lot of times we just don't see the bears. We're out there fishing. We have fish fever and you get a fish on and it's pretty exciting. And then um, a bear might see that that water splashing from some nearby alders and come running out toward that fish. And that's where we might just cut the line. So it's good to have a pair of cutters handy um, on your vest when you're out there cook, um, out there fishing. Um, so keep that in mind when you're out fishing. Now, let's just back up a sec. If you are out there fishing along a river or stream and a bear does approach along the river or stream and you see them at a distance, a sow with cubs like along the Russian and they're working that same corridor right along the edge of the river that I'm fishing in, I'm gonna reel in slowly, pick up that cooler or my gear and I'm gonna move off that river or stream slowly before that bear gets within, within uh, my range, you know, within a quarter mile or so, I'm going to move off because I don't want to have a bear encounter with that maternal female and cubs or for any bear for that matter. So it's good to be observant when we're out there paying attention because the bears are fishing too. 
mountain bikers. We have these single tracks all over town and we have the snow bike folks out there all winter. And, and we have the mountain bikers out there all summer and even the gravel bikes and the road bikes, et cetera. Um, a lot of bikers out there. Just remember if you're on one of our many single tracks, uh, which are world-class right here in our backyard, uh, Kincaid or up on the hillside in the Muni area, um, high speed can be high risk. So if you're ripping around those corners and it's thick brush and alder, you could run into a moose or a bear. So it's good to slow down where our vision's obstructed and pay attention. But if I can't see well, it's good to slow down a little bit. Carry the bear spray accessible, um, preferably on your body and not on the bike, just in case you get separated from your bike, okay? Because you can easily encounter a bear or a moose while you're out there cycling. Slow down around those blind, blind curves and all those blind spots. Watch for bear sign and moose sign. If you see all those willows kind of with the teeth marks where they've been <laughs> scraping the bark on the willow, pay attention to that stuff out there. Use a noisemaker on the bike. A lot of people have all kinds of noisemakers out there. The kids have them. It's good to make noise and not be silent, not be quiet. Um, do not wear the headphones out there. You know, keep the helmet on, but um, it's not good to have the, the music on while you're out there on a single track, just because those ears can really help you uh, determine if there is a bear or a moose up ahead of you. Uh, so keep that in mind. Ride in a group, wear the helmet, have fun. Um, around the neighborhood, around the home, um, probably the, the number one attractant is the trash and the garbage. And it's really ideal if we can have a trash can like the one on the right. The bear resistant trash can works much better than a traditional trash can. But just remember that a bear can get into just about any trash can if it's out there long enough and it's pungent and it smells really good to a bear, like with fish smells or grease smells or anything along those lines. So keep that in mind. It's really good to put that trash out in the morning, the day of trash pickup. Uh, so that's the, the best option to put it out in the morning a little bit earlier because sometimes the, the trash truck comes around quite early. Um, it's better than putting it out all night long because if it's out there all night and it's got some intriguing smells, uh, if a bear has all night, it can crack that safe, okay? It can smell those smells. It can do push-ups on that bear resistant trash can. And yes, it, 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 they can pop it open. However, the resistant trash can is much better than that traditional trash can. So make sure you secure the lid and put it out the morning of. Now the other attractants that attract bears and sometimes moose into our yards, our neighborhood, um, are the dog food, cat food. So it's good to bring the crunch in at night, bring the dog food in, inside at night. Um, it's good to bring those bird feeders down around April when the bears start to emerge and start looking for food sources. And then we put them back up again, oh, around Thanksgiving when the snow falls and bears start to go back down into hibernation. But it's good to clean up that bird seed in the spring, summer, and fall uh, just because bears, especially black bears, are really attracted to that bird seed. Uh, so take those bird feeders down in the spring, summer, and fall, and then put them back up in the winter months if you're feeding uh, birds out in your yard. The trash should be in a bear-resistant trash can or a traditional trash can. It shouldn't just be out there in those garbage bags because the bears can easily get into that. And once those bears start becoming food conditioned um, and they're getting food and garbage in our neighborhood, they're going to be back again and again. So it's really important to try to break that cycle and secure that trash into a bear resistant trash can. If you have fish parts because you're filleting up that fish, um, you know, and you have that, that freezer filled with fish, it's really important to uh, take those parts and, and don't just put them in the trash can because they'll really um, make that trash can very attractive through that pungent fishy smell. It's good to if it's not trash pickup day to put those scraps in a Ziploc bag, throw them in the freezer, and then the day of trash pickup, pull out that bag of frozen scraps and put them in the trash. But if that trash can gets kind of uh, fishy smelling, it'll stick with the, 
it'll stay with that trash receptacle and it eventually will maybe attract bears in, into your trash. So keep that in mind. Now, if you have chickens and you like to get some food local besides fresh salmon and other, other food in our backyards uh, that we harvest, um, if you have these chickens, it's really important to have an electric fence uh, because uh, boy, bears can get into those chickens quite easily um, as other predators too, um, like lynx or goshawks or even a neighborhood dog. So it's really important to electrify those chickens. Um, the electric fence works really well. We have a, a link on our website uh, with the Alaska Department of Fish and Game where we um, go through how to assemble and how to make your own uh, electric fence if you have livestock. So protect your livestock, put up an electric fence. Here's a, um, a video that was shot with a camera collar that was put on a bear here in town. And it's, we were learning a, a bit more about our urban bears, bears that get into trouble in town. And we can see how easily bears can get into trouble in our community. So here's a bear uh, with a camera around its collar. So you'll see the chin of the bear. It's kind of like a bear with a GoPro. Here we go. You see them easily getting into the bird seed. It's right there in the yard. The greasy grill with the grease trap, a big attractant. And then the chickens and the livestock without an electric fence. That's an easy chicken dinner for that bear. Dog food and cat food should come in at night. And then the garage door. If the door is wide open, that's an open invite for bears to come in and check out our freezer, our trash. Um, our oils and gasoline, things like that. They'll, they're, they are very attracted to all of these smells. So it's really important when we do um, leave the house, say we're running down to the store on a weekend, to remember to close that garage door because these things happen very quickly. Uh, we don't want to invite those um, bears in, and sometimes moose in, into, our, into our garages. So close that garage door. Let's switch gears and talk about moose safety especially this time of year, bears are starting to uh, probably getting ready to hibernate out there. And, but we, they are still out and about bears, but moose are very prevalent in our community in the winter months. And it's really good again, to know the do's and the don'ts around alces, alces, the moose, and especially in the spring when those calves are born. Um, boy, uh, remember when those calves are born, the maternal uh, female, the, the cow um, is very protective of those calves and have, they have to fend off predators like bears and other predators uh, from those calves. So we don't wanna get, get too close to these calves accidentally. And cause this female moose can be very uh, protective and very dangerous. So uh, keep that in mind when the calves are born, especially in the spring. Um, and then throughout the summer and the fall as well. Now, this is a real common scenario for us in Anchorage. We're hiking a trail and then up oh, there, we, we see one of these giant moose up in the trail in front of us. You know, what do you do? Okay, you see that moose up there? Well, don't approach because um, very simply those ears can go back and that moose can put a rush on you. So it's really important, don't approach. Um, sometimes we're gonna be a little bit late especially if we're returning and we're trying to get back home again. Um, if I'm still on my way out, I'm going to pause and, and give that moose a lot of time and room to move off the trail. And I'm going to use my discretion as to whether it's at a safe distance to move by this moose or just to wait, wait it out a little bit or go back the way I came. Okay, so it's good to pay attention to the moose's body language. And we're talking about the ears in particular. Okay, if those ears are up and the moose is giving us a hard stare, I call that the stink eye. Um, that means the, the moose is very focused on me and maybe concerned about me. But if I see the ears drop, uh oh, you know, we're in trouble now because what can come next in a second is a rush. And these animals are very fast. So don't approach. If you see those ears going down, move away quickly. It's okay to run from a moose. Now, um, we don't run from bears, right? We hold our ground if we see a bear, but we 
do run from moose. Okay, this is a large herbivore and we wanna move away quickly if we're too close. It's okay to run behind a, a, a parked car, a tree, inside the house behind something big. So keep that in mind. Notice the moose on the left has an injury under, um, under the, the front left leg. And this is a pretty common thing in town as well because moose will try to hurdle a fence, they get injured. Um, so uh, an injured moose can be, a more, can be more dangerous. So keep that in mind, pay attention. And you see the hackles up to this, the ears are back, the hackles are up and sometimes they lick the lips. And that means that that moose may very well rush or charge or try to kick you. And we don't want to end up in the ER. So it's really important if I see a moose, I'm increasing my distance and it's okay to run from the moose. All right, keep that in mind. Don't stand still if you're too close to a moose. Move away quickly and try to get behind something big. Now, this is a, a problem in town is feeding wildlife. It's, it's against the law. Um, but it's a real serious safety issue. So please do not feed the moose um, in your yards. You're not helping the animal. Um, what you are doing is food conditioning the animal if you feed them. And therefore that animal may learn very quickly that humans represent a food source or a snack. And so in a sense, they'll start approaching humans. So if this bull moose learns to uh, associate humans with a food reward, um, you or your child could be just walking down the street and here comes this moose and he's approaching because this moose may think he's gonna receive a food reward. Whereas uh, another moose that's not food conditioned won't typically do that. Okay, so please don't feed them. They become food conditioned and then they become a nuisance and it doesn't end well for moose because ultimately if these moose start to follow people, um, people are gonna call the police or uh, fish and game and the police may call us and we're going to have to respond to that moose if it becomes too dangerous and and sometimes we have to euthanize them if they become um, a safety concern in our community so please, please don't feed them uh, also just like the bears it's really good to secure the trash put it out the morning of trash pickup don't leave those plastic bags out there outside the receptacle make sure the lid is on securely because even the moose can become food conditioned um, and this can be a problem. So please secure that trash when you put it out on trash pickup day. This is a, a public safety announcement um, we put together with the department. And um, this is Miles the Moose and he says, hey there, give your hazards a flash to avoid a crash. And we're just trying to remind drivers that if you do see a moose and it's in the road, hit your flashers, you know, your hazard lights to let, to notify uh, the other motorist that there is a moose in the road or nearby. So people have a chance to pump the brakes and slow down uh, before they all of a sudden see a moose or try to get around a car that's slowing down and uh, hit the ice. And, you know, many people are injured in accidents, vehicular accidents, uh, as a result of, of hitting a moose. So it's good to pay attention out there. Um, use those hazards if a moose is near the road and just pay close attention out there. Okay, who do you call? All right, if, if it's a life-threatening emergency, um, whether it's a bear or a moose and it's life-threatening, uh, go ahead and call 911, okay? However, if you're having a concern about a bear or a moose that is not life-threatening, you have several options. If it's after hours, you can call the Alaska State Trooper Dispatch and the number is here at 907-352-5401. And this is a good time to um, take your camera out and get a picture of this slide in terms of who to contact if you have some concerns about wildlife. Um, you can also report a sighting or a, a non-emergency on the Fish and Game online reporting site, uh, www.adfg.alaska.gov. Um, if we are having a concern about, a safety concern about um, bears or moose or other wildlife that is not an emergency, um, you can contact our area biologist or our assistant area biologists, and that would be Dave Battle, our area biologist. His contact information is right here, uh, or Corey Stantorf, our assistant area biologist, or Tim Spivey, 
as well. And, and these are professionals that deal with all kinds of uh, wildlife concerns and issues in our community. Uh, so these are some of the folks that you can contact um, if you um, have a concern about wildlife. Now, at this point of the talk, um, I, I'd like to turn over uh, to, back to the audience and see if you have questions. And I'm going to turn this back over to um, the Alaska Zoo and see if folks have some questions out there. All right, thank you so much, Tom. Um, if you guys have any questions, you can go ahead and direct them to the chat. We have um, a few minutes to answer any questions for those who have joined us. I saw a couple of people came in a little bit later. So welcome, thank you for coming. Um, Tom, that was an awesome presentation, very informative. I'm a um, sort of new person to Alaska. So um, super helpful to hear everything you had to say. Um, one question I have, um, Tom, is if have you ever encountered a bear, um, and what what did that encounter look like? Sure. Um, yeah, I've encountered bears over the years, and mostly when you encounter a bear, say you're with a group, you group up, you stand your ground. Oftentimes, if a bear becomes aware of of the group, many bears, not always, but many bears just move off. Um, they don't want to encounter people, but sometimes uh, a subadult bear uh, can be curious and approach a group. That's not uncommon for a subadult bear kind of testing uh, a little bit when they're subadults. And it's really important in that moment, if a bear does approach you, is that you hold the ground, talk to the bear in that human voice calmly, and stand that ground, okay? No running, no panicking, things of that nature. And what typically happens is a bear will usually get to a certain point and move off. Now we know that accidents happen, right? That's why we're having this talk tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's really important um, to follow those protocols when that happens. Also um, ready that deterrent. If a bear comes with, especially if you see a bear within range, ready to deterrent, make ready. And that's why it's good not to have it in the backpack, but to have it accessible. Um, and so it's really important to have that, that deterrent handy uh, when that happens. It is very stressful when a bear does approach us. We, we get adrenaline on board, that heart rate increases. And that's just a physiological uh, reaction when that happens. And it's really important, even if you catch yourself moving back to stop and reassess. And often when a bear does approach, they're assessing, they're, they're assessors and predators are like this, they're assessors. They're always assessing their, their surroundings. So it's really important when you hold your ground and you don't run, you are not acting like prey. Okay, you're being assertive. And most bears get to a certain point and move off. And sometimes, unfortunately, accidents do happen. Awesome, thank you so much for that. Um, one question we have is, when you come upon a grazing moose on a trail, how far off the trail should they be before you move off? Really good question. Um, so much of that really depends on the behavior of the moose. I think if the, if the moose moves off and seems disinterested, um, I like the moose to be a good 50 yards away um, before I, uh, it's easy to get cavalier and think, well, that moose moved off but he's just in the brush off the trail. And as I move by, that moose could have been a stressed moose. And maybe that stressor as I move closer, even though the, the moose is right, you know, within 50 feet, right behind the, the willows or the alders, that, that moose can charge right out of there, especially if my dog's barking. So I like to see a moose a ways away, a good 50 yards kind of moving, moving away. Um, that would be ideal. Um, and sometimes we have to use our discretion out there about that, dis that distance. Um, but watch the moose's body language. Does the moose look stressed? Are the ears back? Um, is the moose looking at me or is the moose disinterested and going to scrape some willow up, up the, the drainage? Um, so the, learning to read that body language is, is a good idea. Yeah, what I've definitely one thing I've encountered is looking around to see if there's any calves nearby as well. Um, you know, <laughs> that's a huge, huge part of that, I think. I'm glad you mentioned that because that's a real common scenario. A moose passes in front of us on the road or uh, on the trail and we think the coast is clear. So in the car, we start to accelerate 
but lo and behold, here comes that, that calf, um, even if it's a large calf in, in the fall, right? And they're right behind. So when you see that moose cross the road, pay close attention or the trail because there's, they, especially right now, I mean, I was out this morning walking the dogs and I saw some moose off the trail and there wasn't just one moose. There's a group of moose out there. Uh, so it's really important to keep eyes out for other moose. And there could be a moose on either side of the trail or the road. So be observant, use your senses, and try to be patient because uh, we get in a rush and we're just trying to get by. And sometimes it's better just to hold back, be a few minutes late, and stay on the safe side. Awesome. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, another question we have is, is there a time of year or two when a moose may be more aggressive than other times of the year? Yes, uh, especially in the fall when the, in the rut, uh, when the, er, the males and the females are pretty geared up, um, you know, uh, um, bulls are following cows and there's a lot of activity. Um, there be, can be some competition between animals, so they can be very geared up in the fall. And that's when the bulls still have a rack and they're following around like they, are, they have been the last few months. Um, and then in the winter months, sometimes when they drop, uh, they shed their, you know, the antlers, um, sometimes things calm down in the winter um, and there's not so much of that following behavior going on. And, but then again, in the spring, when those maternal females, when those cow moose um, give birth to their calves, they're extremely protective. Um, and so they're used to uh, chasing off uh, small black bears or being very vigilant for their calves. So they're geared up. So if we accidentally get too close uh, to that cow and calf, um, they, they can be very stressed. And so I, I think in the spring and in the fall, um, that time of year, uh, moose can be a, a little bit potentially more dangerous depending on the scenario. Okay, so yeah, keep that in mind. Be aware of that. Yeah, yeah, we definitely see that at the zoo uh, with our two moose when our, our males go into rut. It's funny, they'll um, follow around all the female zookeepers. <laughs> I don't know if it's like a hormone thing or what, but um, it's kind of funny to see. Um, another question we have is what happens if a moose and a bear collide? So if they interact or approach one another. Yeah, uh, this is a, 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 a common scenario for many of us Alaskans out on the trails. Uh, we come around the corner on a trail and sure enough, there's a moose. And when those moose have calves in the spring, uh, there could be a predator, like a, a, a black bear or a brown bear, um, and they, they may be pursuing those calves. And so we have this predator-prey interaction going on, right? And we don't want to get in the mix. We don't, we don't want to get in the middle of that situation. So if I see that moose, I mean, if I see a moose in general, I'm not going to approach. But if I see a moose and I hear some huffing and popping, um, I'm going to be moving away slowly, okay? Keeping plenty of distance um, so I don't get in the mix just in case um, a, a bear tries to chase a calf or a moose tries to chase off a small black bear. And I don't want to be around these stressed animals that are running. Um, so it's good to try to move away from those scenarios. Uh, but that's a real life situation for us Alaskans, especially here in Anchorage, uh, where we have these predator prey interactions going on around us. Now, in one, one sense, it's an amazing thing because we get to see these things, but it's always good to see them through the binos or the scope at a, at a great distance and not up close because uh, we don't want to be kicked by a moose or, or run over by one of these animals. Uh, so keep that in mind. Yeah. Awesome. All right. The next question we have is, do moose have a chase instinct? Um, for example, will they chase me if I ride by on my bike? They can. They, they can chase you. If a moose, uh, that's different than a predator. But if a moose chases uh, defensively or it's just uh, agitated, and I think it's easy to take that neighborhood moose for granted because they normally don't bother us. And we sort of become complacent around them, right? Because they're, we see that same moose with a, a mark on its neck or what have you, and they typically don't bother us. But on a given day, that moose could be stressed and uh, for a number of reasons that we don't know about. And so all of a sudden we, we bike or hike or walk just a little too close to that moose and they, they can uh, be like a racehorse and, and come after us and try to throw a kick. 
Um, so it's really important um, to know that and not to take that distance for granted. Always give them a little bit more space. And uh, typically we don't, we see them and we don't typically have problems, but every now and then, as we know, there are serious injuries or worse. So it's, it's good to be vigilant and pay attention and just give these amazing animals space and room, both black bears, brown grizzly bears and uh, moose. Uh, don't crowd them. Yeah. All right. Um, are there, speaking of when animals are more aggressive, are there times of the year when bears are more aggressive and, and why would that be? Well, in a sense, um, particularly females with cubs, um, I think in the spring, summer, and fall, uh, maternal females are very protective. Um, so obviously they're, they're uh, hibernating in winter months, um, but, um, but keep that in mind, you know, uh, they're super protective that time of year. And also um, in the spring, uh, in June, give or take, uh, you know, late May, early July, um, a lot of males are following females. Um, and whenever you have these kinds of behaviors, these following behaviors going on, um, there's a lot of stress related to that. So you don't want to um, get into a middle of a situation like that accidentally, um, in, especially uh, in the spring months. Um, and then that, that's something to keep in mind uh, for, for bears as well as moose. Um, and in general, we want to keep that in mind. But in the spring, I think sometimes during the following behavior and uh, maternal females with cubs um, can, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's more dangerous, but it can't, they can be a little more geared up that time of year with hormones and things like that. Sure. You mentioned that might be a time of stress. Um, uh, one question is, uh, I've heard that a bear seemingly or yawning is probably a sign of a stressed bear. So you said the following um, of the females is kind of a sign that may be a stressful time. Um, is yawning a sign of a stressed bear and what other signs should we look for? Yeah. You mentioned uh, and all that. Sure. The yawn can be a, can be a sign of stress or, or the bear could just be yawning. Um, but you know, if I do see a, an animal yawning, I mean, hopefully I'm far away with my bins or my binoculars or, or a scope. Um, but um, if I also see like when males are following females in the spring, um, they generally are huffing and popping, you know, they're making this and they're a little worked up and geared up. And so in a sense, um, you know, um, if I see the yawning associated with some huffing and some popping, I know that that's most likely a stressed animal. And so uh, kind of like with the moose, when the ears go back and the hackles go up, definitely signs of stress. So keep that in mind because um, a stressed animal can be more dangerous. Um, so it's good to know that. Um, um, on the other side, could, could a bear just be yawning uh, and, you know, uh, kind of taking a, a laying down somewhere on a spit along uh, wild Alaska shirt. Sure, yeah, but if I see it associated with other behaviors, I'm thinking that animal's looking a little stressed right now. So it's good to pay attention to the body language and to know a little bit about that. Awesome. Um, another question we have is, what do you call a group of moose? Oh, you got me on that one. A group of moose. Um, I, I do not know what you call a group of moose, but I, I work with some experts down the hall and I could uh, check with a few folks about a group of moose. Um, the moose does go by a scientific name, Alces Alces. Uh, it's kind of like the same name for both the genus and the species. And here in Alaska, we live with Alces Alces Gaius. We live with a giant among different subspecies of moose. Um, wow. Uh, on earth. Uh, so we, we do live with these large moose, Alces, Alces, Gaius. Awesome. Very cool. Um, another question we have is what happens when two mama moose with a calf encounter? So is there any aggressive behavior when um, two mama moose encounter each other? Oh, it's possible. It's possible. Um, sometimes calves, cows can be a little, uh, oh, you know, a little bit uh, more aggressive if they if there's an issue with one family group getting close to another family group, um, but sometimes too they're very tolerant of each other because the, the animals do have amazing recognition, 
and sometimes they seem appear to uh, maybe maybe they've had encountered the same moose in the past and it's been fairly benign or they're not competitive and sometimes they they sort of um, maybe could act a little uh, try to run the other moose off uh, so it can go both ways it really depends on the situation right um, the last question we have for tonight is what's the difference between a brown bear and a grizzly bear and are their temperaments different I know you mentioned um, the physical differences but are their temperaments different at all yeah just to back up a click uh, a lot of times I call them brown grizzly bears because it's the bear with two names um, same species um, Ursus arctos along the coast here in areas where bears eat fish and have access to fish, we often call them brown bears. And that same animal that lives in the interior, like up in Denali, uh, we would call them a grizzly bear. So it's more of a habitat difference. Um, coastal bears are often coastal brown bears or brown bears, interior more uh, grizz. And so what's different? Well, the habitat is different. And here along the coast, if I was to generalize, we have robust habitat. We have the salmon, the sedge grasses, the berries, we have clams, we have all kinds of uh, diversity uh, for bears. And they have, uh, you know, they're generalists. They have an amazing um, amount of choice and to, to get calories, to get food, right? The interior bear uh, in general has to work a little harder for their calories. And so they typically sometimes are more spread out unless it's a concentrated food source. And they, they usually are smaller uh, in the interior than the coastal brown bear. There's always exceptions, but in general. So in the interior, um, you know, brown grizzly bears um, often um, are, uh, boy, they, they can behaviorally be, be a little different than coastal brown bears. Um, all bears can potentially be dangerous, coastal brown bears or grizz. So I don't want to give any misinformation. Um, but in areas where bears uh, do have plentiful food, maybe there's less food stress. And in the interior, they have to work a little harder. Um, so we are gonna respond to those two animals the same way, you know, travel in the group, make noise. If we have that encounter, group up. If the bear doesn't notice us, back away slowly, keep your eyes on the bear. If the bear does notice us, group up, stand your ground, whether it's a, a coastal, brown bear or an interior grizz. So we're gonna follow those same safety um, uh, responses um, with either species, but it's mostly a habitat difference. They're technically both the same species, uh, Ursus arctos. Nice, okay, yeah. And we, at the zoo, we have, um, we have a grizzly brown bear and then a brown bear. So we have that interior and the um, coastal and like you were saying, um, our grizzly is is smaller. She looks a little more grizzled. That's how we remember her. Um, but awesome to to note those um, habitat differences. All right. Well, I think we are about yeah eight o'clock eight o two. So um, super thankful for you, Tom, and coming on as well as um, Alaska Department of Fish and Game. And um, as we wrap up here, we will um, be talking about a little bit next month um, on Wednesday, November 24th at 7 p.m. Um, we're going to be having Drew Hamilton. He's a photographer. He'll be coming to us from Churchill and he's gonna discuss his time um, with his um, photography and his magnificent polar bears that he's seen of the Hudson Bay area. Um, the Zoom link that you guys use to log into this chat is um, gonna be the same one that will be used in November, so. Um, again, Tom, thank you so much. Super informative. Um, thank you so much for taking those questions at the end. Um, I know we all really appreciate it. So hope you have a great night and thanks for coming on. Thank you very much. Awesome. Bye guys.